morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? You guys doing well? All right, good stuff. Well, if you haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Braddon. I'm the student pastor here at Free Grace United. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with us this morning. I know, hello, how's it going, dude? <laughs> I got a wave. That was great. That made my whole day. Anyway, so glad that you're coming here to church th here this morning. We've been studying through the book of Proverbs. Everybody say Proverbs. For like the last like couple months, okay? And we're going to continue studying through the, Pro the book of Proverbs today, but it's going to be like seriesception, okay? We're going to do a series within a series. We're still talking about Proverbs, but we're going to talk about a very specific idea as we study through the book of Proverbs, and that's this idea of build the kingdom. Everybody say build the kingdom. The purpose of this conversation is to talk about how we want to build God's kingdom, not our kingdom. That in everything that we want to do, that we say, God, you get every single part of my life. I surrender all to you. God, I want to build your kingdom and not my kingdom. That's what this conversation is going to be about for the next couple weeks. And so I want to, I want to start with the verse today. It's Matthew 6.10. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, that's, that's what we want that's what we want. We want God's will to be done, not our will to be done. God's plans to be done, not our plans. Amen? Amen. Now, as part of this conversation, I'm going to give you kind of like just a precursor of the next six weeks and all these different conversations that we're going to have for the next six, we six weeks. So to, uh, this morning, we're talking about kingdom surrender. Everybody say surrender. We're going to be talking about abandoning our plans for God's greater kingdom purposes next week. Everybody say next week. We're talking about kingdom vision. That's Pastor Eric's house was talking about a second ago. Next week is a big, big deal for the life of the church. Pastor Eric is going to be talking to us about uh, uh, where Holy Spirit is leading us as a church together as a whole, where we're headed together. And if you want to know where we're headed, be there next week, guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, then we're going to talk about kingdom faith, kingdom purpose, kingdom wisdom, and lastly, kingdom commitment. Guys, I believe this, this series, Build the Kingdom, is going to radically alter not only the life of the church, but also your life individually. And so my challenge for you is to be here for all six weeks. Everybody say, don't miss a week. Don't miss a week. This is going to be an incredible conversation. Now, we got a lot to talk about today, uh, and we got a short amount of time to do it. So everybody say, buckle up. Are you, guys ready to are you guys ready to let it rip today? We're going to go quick. Are you ready? All right, so the, well, like I said a second ago, our topic today is kingdom surrender. Everybody say, kingdom surrender. And the idea is abandoning our plans for God's greater purposes. Like I said, we're still in the book of Proverbs, and our core text today is this. This is Proverbs 19.21. It says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. You can make many plans, but God's plan will prevail. That's the convert. This is the verse that's going to guide our conversation for today. I just want to take a second and pray, invite God in this conversation, and then we're going to get rolling. God, thank you so much just for the opportunity to be in your house here this morning and the opportunity to be in your presence and spend time in your word. God, I pray that you would speak through me. Let these be your words and not mine. If I say something dumb, help everybody forget. That would be rad. But God, I pray that you help everybody find the one thing that's just for them because everyone here is on purpose. They're not here uh, by accident. You have a word that is specifically designed for each of us. So Lord God, help us find that one thing that's just for us. God, help us get an idea of what it looks like to surrender all, to surrender all at your feet and say, you get every part of my life. Lord Jesus, and help us be fun. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, now, by raise of hands, raise your hand if you're a really, really good planner. Raise your hand if you're a good planner. Okay, every service, it's like only like 25% of the room. Now, raise your hand if you're kind of one of those fly by the seat of your pants type of people. Okay, I love you. I'm glad you're in church. You're all the bane of my existence, okay? I, I need to have a plan in everything that I do because it's within my plan and within my routine that I feel like I have some semblance of control over my life and I feel safe. The fly by the seat of your pants type of people, I, man, I'm, again, I'm glad you're here. I just don't understand. Now, regardless of whether or not you think you're a fly by the seat of your pants kind of person or a planner, we all have plans for our life, right? We'll have, we all have ideas and plans for how we want it to go, things we want, things we want to accomplish, ways that we think our life is going to go as a whole. Just to put a, get, get like the juices pumping, a couple ideas about things that we make plans about. So, you know, what will I be when I grow up? These are questions that we ask ourselves. What, what am I going to be when I grow up? And people, uh, people ask you that when you're like eight. You're like, what do you, you want to be when you grow up? And then you don't really know what to say when you're eight. And then back when, then, then like when you're 28, you still don't really know what the answer to that question is. But we, 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 make, we make plans for, hey, what, what, are we, what am I going to do after high school? Make, we make plans for, for work and for college, we make plans for our career, plans for dating, plans for who we're going to marry, you know, plans uh, for how we're going to spend our money, plans for kids or no kids, or plans for where we're going to live. We make all of these plans in our life, yes? Yes? Now, by raise of hands again, 
How many of you had every single one of those things go exactly according to plan? Like all your plans were just perfect. Oh, weird, all weekend, nobody raised their hands to that because it just, it doesn't happen, right? Our plans are fickle. They are not perfect. They're always subject, uh, subject to change. They're constantly changing and evolving. Our plans are like an Etch-A-Sketch, okay? You can kind of like, you know, you twist the little knobs and kind of get it how you want it to set up and you make the drawing. You're like, I think I'm gonna do this thing over here. And then every once in a while, someone just walks up and goes, <laughs> and you're like, dang it. And they gotta start all over again, right? This is what our plans are like. Our plans are like an Etch-A-Sketch. We try to make plans for our life, but it just never really seems to come to fruition, right? Now, on the other hand, God also has plans for your life. Heaven also has a plan for your life. Heaven has a plan for when you grow up. Heaven has a plan for what you do after high school. Heaven has a plan for, for college. God has a plan for your career, who you should date, who you should marry. He cares about that stuff. God has a plan for your money. He has a plan for kids or no kids. He has a plan for whether, uh, where, where you should retire and how you should live. God has all sorts of good plans for your life. And th here's the thing. They are just that. They are good plans, and they are more stable and more steady than our plans. Amen? A bunch of verses about this in Scripture. This is Acts 17. It says, from one man, he made, every, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. Think about that for a second. People have been on this earth for about like 6,000 years. And you could have been born at any single point along that entire time scale. You could have been born a long time ago. And yet, God determined the exact time and place that he wanted you to be. You are in the right place, the right time period right now, because it was God's plan. Psalm 139 says, your eyes saw my, unform, my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be, before you were even born. God had plans for your life. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, uh, plans to, give you, uh, to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. If that's good news, say amen. amen. That's what God has for you. He has good plans for your life. He wants, to take you, he wants to take you far. He wants to take you on an incredible journey. He wants to take you someplace you never thought you could go. Your life has purpose. Your life has meaning. Scripture says that you are God's masterpiece, that he intricately put you together exactly as you are so that you could accomplish something specific on this world. God has good plans for your life. And now the core, the, the core idea of what Solomon is trying to teach us through this proverb is this idea of, do we choose God's plans or do we choose our plans? And what's the difference? And here's, here's the main heart of Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs 19.21. And this is, like the, this is like the thesis statement of this talk today. Okay, this is the, most, this is the really important kind of sentence that's going to guide the entire rest of the conversation. We must surrender our imperfect plans to embrace God's perfect plan for our lives. I'm going to say it again, because this, this is the whole crux of the whole message. We must surrender our imperfect plans to embrace God's perfect plans for our life. And the key word there is surrender. Everybody say surrender. God is after surrender. God is after full, wholehearted, complete surrender to his will and his way. This is what he's after. And each person needs to come to this conclusion in their life. And at some point, there has to be a moment where you say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all to you. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to just live, you know, one foot on God's plans and one foot on my plans. God is not, uh, scripture calls that lukewarm faith. God is not after lukewarm faith with your life. He is after whole, complete, wholehearted surrender. Because he has good plans for you. But in order to get those good plans, you have to say, Lord God, I, I don't live for me. My life is not my own. It does not belong to me. I don't want to do life my way. I give everything I have over to you because your way is better. Guys, this is what surrender looks like. And this is what being a Christian is. I think a lot of people think that being a Christian is just, you know, saying a prayer so that we get our little certificate that says get out of hell free, right? Right? You say, you say a prayer in church service, you're like, okay, I got my, I got my get out of hell free card, so I'm good to go. That's not what God is after with, for with your life. He is after wholehearted, complete surrender, saying, I just want to live for you and you alone. And this is a decision that we all have to make. This is a decision that we all have to make over the course of our lives. And this is a decision that I have made 
in my life. I don't get it right every single time, and I never pretend to, but this is a decision that I have made. I, I gave my life to Jesus when I was, when I was seven years old. Uh, I grew up in church. My, my parents are pastors, so I grew up in church, and you know, when you're seven, you know, you hear the preacher preach, and like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. I want to I get my get out of hell free card. So, like, of course I want to be Christian. Of course I, I want to follow God. And so I, I gave my life to Christ, and I got baptized when I was seven. But even at a, even at a young age, even as, and even as, like, a, a young teenager until I was about, like, 15 or 16, I still felt a lot of resistance to God's plan. I called myself Christian. I, called, I said that I, I followed God because, you know, I prayed the prayer. Like, I got, I got my card that said, get out of hell free, but I didn't submit every part of my life to God, and I didn't really want to do life his way because I had my own plan. Even at a, even at a young age, I had my own plan. My plan was to get some good grades in high school. I was going to graduate from high school. I was going to go enlist in the Marines. I was going to go to OCS and become an officer, and I was going to make a career out of it. That's what I was going to do. I, had my, I, I, talked to my, I had to talk to my relatives who were in the military. You know, I talked to my friends who were in the military. I had a plan. I got my parents' permission, the whole thing. I had a plan for my life. And every time someone would walk up to me on a Sunday and be like, are you going to be a pastor like your dad someday? I was like, would you just leave me alone? I felt where God was pushing me. I felt his plan trying to move into my life, and yet I still felt resistance. But then there was a moment in my life where I just decided, I, I, don't, think I, can, I don't think I can live life for myself. I don't think, even though I, I don't, I don't want to just pretend to be Christian, I don't want to just call myself Christian, I want to actually just submit everything I have to Christ's hands and go where he calls me to go and be who he calls me to be, and I know this is a decision that I made because I wrote it down. It was really cool. I, I found this this week, actually. I knew this, I knew this note existed somewhere, and it was in one of my old Bibles. This was my, the Bible that I read growing up. And there's a note in it where I just wrote out a prayer to God. It was between him and I saying, I'm all in. I, I'm, I'm in full and complete and total surrender. And here's, here's what I wrote. This is January 22nd, 2015, so almost 10 years ago. I just wrote, I, Brad and Dykstra, fully and completely give my life to God, and I will do anything he wants me to do. I believe that I'm called to ministry, and right now I'm acknowledging that to myself and to God. God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I am yours. Do with me what you please. You have my time. You have my talents. You have my money, my relationships. You have my focus. From this point forward, my goal in life is to further the kingdom of God in whatever way he pleases. Use me, God. I am yours. This is a letter that I wrote just between God and I so that I could say, God, I just want to live my life for you and for your kingdom and your will alone. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to become a pastor, and this doesn't mean that you have to become a missionary or whatever, that you have to work in a church, but it's a mindset of surrender saying, I just don't live for me. I don't live for my plans. I don't live to build my kingdom. I just, whatever God would ask, I will go and I will do. And Lord Jesus, I'm just curious to see what you would have me do. This is what surrender looks like, you guys. And this is what God is after for in your life. He just doesn't, he, he wants to take you someplace so far, but you have to surrender all. Everybody say surrender all. So how do we actually surrender all to Jesus, and what would this actually look like? I want to spend the remainder of this message just going through five thoughts. Everybody say five thoughts. Five thoughts about how to surrender all to Jesus. Like I said, we're going to go through this really, really quick because we got a short amount of time and a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to go fast here. Everybody say, buckle up. Number one, in every area of our life, we seek the Lord. What surrender looks like is in every area of our life that we just seek the Lord. God wants to be God of every part of your life, not just a few of them. God wants to be Lord of all. Everybody say, Lord of all. I know I've used this analogy before, and so has Pastor Eric. In fact, I probably stole it from him. But I'm going to repeat it again just because I think it's, it's really, really helpful. Imagine your life as a tackle box, okay? You've got a tackle box with all these different compartments. So imagine you've got, you, you got your, your relationships, you've got your, 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 your marriage, you've got your parenting, you've got your money, you've got your career, you've got all these different pockets, all these little compartments in your life. God wants to be God of every single one of those compartments, not just some of them. God wants to be Lord of all. He wants to be the center of how you think about your work life. He wants to be the center of how you think about your, your, your education, your college. He wants to be the center of how you, you honor him with, his, with, with your career, your dating, your marriage, your money, your kids, housing situation, retirement. God wants to be the priority and the focus in all of those areas. And that's what surrender looks like. 
full, wholehearted, complete surrender says, God, you don't just get some of these compartments, the ones that are convenient, but God, you get all of these compartments because I just surrender all to you. Every say, surrender all. This is what Psalm 119, 105 says. It says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. So as we follow God and as we study his word and stay in his word, he just shows us the direction to go and he shows us how to keep him the priority of all those areas of our life. So in order to keep him the center in every area of our life, we have to seek his will, right? Everybody say seek his will. And in order to know what his will is, you have to know what the word says. Guys, this is the best way that we know God's will for our lives. This is the primary way that we hear his voice. So if we want to keep him the focus, the center of all those little compartments, we need to know what he thinks. We need to know what his will is. And his will is found in his word. Does that make sense? Everybody say, know his word. Now, we're going to help you with this as a church. I'm really excited for what I'm about to talk about next. This is a big deal. Everybody say, this is a big deal. So in order, it's every pastor's uh, uh, like goal and dream that the congregation that they mentor to would just know the scripture, that they would know the word, so they would know God's will for their lives. And so we wanted to help you with this as a church, and which is why I'm really excited that in 2024, you guys, we are going to spend all 52 weeks, starting January 7th, going through the entire Bible cover to cover. Guys, that's what we're going to do. Starting January 7th, 2024, we're going to go through all 66 books of the Bible. We're going to give you like the, like the, the most important kind of little like parts, uh, the big ideas from each thing, the, the, the like key verses, and how we can apply them to our lives. That's what's going to come up on January 7th. We're going to go through the whole Bible together. Now, this slide that they just put up a touch early, this is also a big deal as well. Everybody say, this is a big deal. So, in addition to going through every weekend, to going through all 66 books on the weekend. We're also doing a live event here in Elk River that we're inviting all of our churches to, okay? It's going to be on January 7th as well. It's going to be from 4 to 7 p.m. We're bringing in an organization called Walk Through the Bible. Everybody say, Walk Through the Bible. And what they're going to, they have the same passion to just help people know the word and know what the scripture says. And so we're bringing them in on January 7th, 4 to 7 p.m. to come in and give us a three-hour crash course in the Old Testament. The whole thing, you guys. This is going to be an incredible event. Now, what I will say, this is a ticketed event, so that's going to be $20 per person. There's no child care provided, so third grade and up is welcome. And it's $20 no matter your age. Everybody say 20 bucks. So it's 20 bucks for this, for this event. It's going to be an absolute blast. The best way to get registered, to get tickets, is to use that QR code that's located both on the screens, your program, and in the lobby. So go get those tickets sooner rather than later. It's going to be an incredible event. And then lastly, just because, again, we want to make sure we're as helpful as possible so we can know the word and know how to keep God the center of every area of our lives. The last thing I'll mention is that we're going to be selling in the lobby, we're going to be selling these super awesome little study binders. So that way, over the course of the year, you can document and log all of your notes that you took over the course of the entire year so that by the end, you're going to have an epic binder that has like the need to know and key stuff about every book in the Bible so that you can keep it at home. Is this helpful? Yes. You guys, we want to help each other know the word because when we know the word, we know God's will and we know what he thinks about all of these different compartments in our life and we can keep him the center. Amen? Just to give you an idea what this walk through the Bible class is going to look like, I want you guys to check this out. I think many people don't read the Bible because culturally it's so different that it's confusing. They don't have a context to understand. What if we could create an event that could make the Bible come alive in a fun and creative way that would inspire people to read it every day? When I heard about this at church, I said I have to go because I need clarity. Everything started to make more sense to me. It's helping me to understand more. People have stories of the Bible, but they don't know how they're connected to a timeline, to a bigger story God's trying to reveal to his people. To be able to connect these stories is huge. A seminar like this is really great at weaving together the larger narrative for God's story. People can locate how the Old Testament connects with the New Testament. Seeing how God's creation story moves leading up to Christ himself is very powerful. 
I've always looked at the Bible and it seems so complicated. I can't really read that language. I don't phonetically truly understand. And when it's done like this, it comes to life. The hand signs really resonate. It helps you to realize what's going on and what really happened. It puts things into perspective. As you're moving, you're remembering. Kinesthetic learning is a lot better than just auditory or even visual learning. So using that movement actually seals the concepts that you're trying to get across. It makes it connect the body to the mind and makes you remember even more. My favorite was the kings. Saul, no heart. King David, whole heart. And King Solomon, half heart. I like that. I liked them all. The fall, the flood. Love Samson, yes. Probably the Passover, because that's so significant. Creation. <laughs> that's everything to me. very relevant for people at all stages of their walk with God. I think it works for all ages. One of the most powerful things is to look out in a crowd and see them practicing the motions, telling the story to each other, celebrating together, and they're doing it from such different generations. As we teach OT Live and NT Live, we see people walk away with such a passion. They don't just go home and, and say, well, that was nice. They go home and they read. And pastors tell us about how their churches have changed through having this type of event. The hope is that they're gonna engage in scripture in a different way that they have a bigger picture. It's one thing to understand this story, but to be able to then go forth and tell that story is a whole new level. I could share with a non-believer an overall picture of the Bible and how it all fits together. I wasn't as familiar with the Old Testament as I am now, so I was happy about learning. I think I'm gonna dig into the Old Testament more and learn more. Definitely can see that it's one full story that God has written. He captured the Old Testament in three hours that went fast. It's awesome, it's fun. My husband and I were both really impressed. After seeing what I saw today, I am so inspired, so encouraged to go in and dig deeper into my Bible. I really didn't expect to come out with the knowledge of what I have now, of the whole Bible. It literally was a walk through the Bible. That is on January 7th. We want everybody to be together for that so that we can walk through the Bible and learn the text together. Is this helpful? Yes, yes this is so helpful because in order to keep God, God, in every area of our life, we need to know the word. Everybody say, know the word. Know the word. Guys, this is what surrender looks like, and this is how we keep him Lord of all. Now, we got to keep trucking. Everybody say, let's keep trucking. Let's keep talking. Number two. So we're talking about surrender, talking about surrendering every area of our life to Christ and what that looks like. Here's my second thought regarding surrender. Number two, we have to count the cost. Everybody say count the cost. In order to surrender, we have to count the cost. This is Luke 14, 18. It says, it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? So, there's always a cost to surrender, isn't there? Yeah, there's always a cost to surrender. And what surrender costs is you have to be willing to say, I am willing to let go of my plans, thoughts, dreams, and desires. I'm willing to let that go. So in order to gain God's thoughts, dreams, and desires for my life, I let go of my plans so I can gain God's plans. And so in order to surrender, we always have to count the cost, we have to determine, is my way better or is God's way better? Is it worth me letting go of what I have so that I can gain what God has for me? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Is my way better or God's way better in college? Is my way better or God's way better at work? Is my way better or God's way better in their career or dating or marriage or money or kids or housing or retirement? Insert whatever you want in there. We have to ask the question and count the cost. Is God's way better or is my way better? Is it worth me letting go of this so I can gain what, ha what God has for me? And here's the thing. When we do sit down and actually count the cost, what we come to the conclusion of is God's way is better than my way. Even though at some point, at some point following God costs you something, you have to be able to let go of something so that you can gain what he has for you. When Jesus, uh, when Jesus came to the disciples when they were out fishing and he said, hey, come and follow me, one of the translations says, what happens next is it says they forsook all and followed him. 
The cost was they had to forsake everything that was in their current plan so they could go and gain what God had. And that is always better than our plans. But if we decide that the cost is not worth it and cling to our own plans, we will miss God's plan and we will miss God's best. There's a, there's a really good story, but it's a really heartbreaking story uh, about the rich young ruler. And I'm going to give you the account from Mark because it outlines this idea really well. It says, now... As he was going out on the road, this is about Jesus, he, as he was going out on the road, one came running, a random guy ran up to him. And he knelt before him and he asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, do not or, uh, honor your father, your father and mother. And then he said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And then Jesus looked at him, loved him. And said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had a great many possessions. So in this story, the rich young ruler runs up to Jesus. He's like, hey, what can I do to follow you? What can I do to make sure I get my fire insurance from hell card, my get out of hell free card? What do I do to make sure that I can do that? And God says, well, hang on, hang on a minute. God knows every heart, right? God knows every heart. And so he could tell that this guy's heart wasn't really in it, that he was not in a heart of surrender. He was just in a heart of, hey, what can I do to make sure, you know, I can get on, I can take care of all my P's and Q's, right? And so he says, hey, I know you got an idol in your heart and it's all your stuff. I want you to go and get rid of your plans and go get rid of that so that you can gain mine. And the guy counted the cost and he said, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth giving up my plan. It's not worth giving up what I want. And so he missed the plan that God had for him. Guys, do not miss God's plan for your life. Do not miss it. It is so much better than our plans. I'm gonna say something really, really clearly. Every time we live for our plans, and every time we, 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 we live for our plans, it is a waste of a life. It's just a waste of time. It is a waste of a life when we live for our kingdom because everything's just going to burn, isn't it? Yes? It's not going to last anyway. And so every time we live for self instead of God, it's a waste of time. We, there's a great story about this. There's, there's a, the, the John Piper, Pastor John Piper, tells a, a great story, a little anecdote that kind of drives this idea home. The way the story goes is like this. There's an old couple together. They've been married for a bunch of years, and it's their dream to go and retire on a beach somewhere. That's what they want. They, that's, that's their dream. That's their goal in life is to retire on the beach together. And so eventually they, they save up all their money, and they put all this time and effort and work and make sure that they can buy their dream home. And they eventually do, and they, they get their dream home. It's on the beach, and so they spend the remainder of their life walking on the beach together and collecting seashells. And eventually they get old, and they pass away, and they go to heaven because they were Christian, right? They go to heaven. But then they meet Jesus in heaven, and he's like, hey, what do you have to show for your time on earth? And they say, well, I mean, like, we collected all these. And they just kind of put forward their, their shells. Guys, what a waste of a life. That's a waste of a life. Guys, they used their time and their energy and their money to build their kingdom, which in the end didn't matter at all, Right? when they could have been using everything they had to surrender all and say, God, I just want to further your kingdom. You get my time, my talents, my treasure. Everything I have is to further your kingdom, not my kingdom. We have to count the cost and ask ourselves the question of, is it worth letting go of my plan so that I can gain God's? Do not make the same mistake as the couple in that story and do not make the same mistake as the rich young ruler. It is always better to gain God's plans, amen? amen? It is always better. But in order to gain God's plans, we have to not make the same mistake as the rich young ruler, which means we have to do what he was unable to do. And what he was unable to do is this, number three, we have to release control. Everybody say release control. In order to gain God's good plan, we have to release control and give God control of our lives. I heard a funny story about how to catch a monkey. Apparently, it's really easy. All you have to do is you have to find something shiny, like a quarter or a coin or something you polish real good, or, or, or like a marble or something, and you drop it in a little hole or something that's just big enough for him to get his hand in it. So what the monkey will do is he'll hobble over and he'll stick his hand in the hole and he'll grab whatever was that shiny thing that was in there. And then what happens? 
he can't get his hand back out because his hand was clenched on what he thought was important. I know we think it's silly because it's like, huh, what a dumb monkey, but don't we do this all the time? Yeah. Don't, we, don't we sometimes we get trapped in our own plans because we just refuse to let go of what we wanted to do and what ends up happening is our own plans just end up trapping us and surrounding in, uh, us, and we get stuck in a place we never wanted to be and that God never designed for you. And it's just simply because we would not let go of control. Guys, God has good plans for your life, but you have to be willing to say, I just, I'm not going to hold on to this anymore. I want your will in your way, and so I'm going to let it go. And it's up to you. A bunch of verses about this in Scripture. This is uh, Psalm 40. It says, I delight in your will. Whose will? God's will. God's will. Not my will, but yours be done. I am not my own. I was, I was bought at a high price. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I have been crucified with Christ, so that no, it's no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ who lives in me. Guys, this is what surrender looks like, and this is what being Christian is is saying the old life is gone. My old plan is gone. I just want to receive what God has for me. I let go of everything. I let go of control. I lay it all at his feet. It is all up to him. I don't want to control my life anyway because I can't. I want God's control in my life so that he can give me the good plans that he ordained for me well before I was born. We have to let go of control. Everybody say let go of control. So ask yourself the question, what area of your life have you not yet let go of control in yet? What's that one tackle box pocket, that one tackle box slot that you're like, God, you can have all these other ones, but this one, this one is mine. Because here's the thing, God wants to bless every single one of those little pockets. But in order, he can't dump much in if your hand is clenched around it, yes? But the second that we release control and say, okay, you get it then he's able to pour blessings in. Guys, God wants to bless your, he wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your sex life. He wants to bless your career, your entertainment, your parenting, your talents, your money. He wants to bless all of these areas of your life. But in order to get what he wants to pour in, you have to open your hand up. And scripture says that he will pour so much in that you won't even know what to do with it. This is what Jesus wants for your life. This is what surrender looks like saying, I, ju I don't control my life. I don't. I don't control my life. And Lord God, I give control to you. This is what surrender looks like. But this is really hard, isn't it? It's really difficult to surrender control because we, don't, we, we, we hold on to things so tightly because we, we don't know what's going to happen, right? That brings me to my fourth thought, number four. When God reveals something to your heart, we just obey God, and we just do it afraid. Everybody say, do it afraid. I heard this awesome idea about courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's just doing the right thing afraid. Courage does not mean that you don't feel fear. It just means, no, I am afraid right now in this moment, but courage means that I'm going to take steps of faith and move forward anyway. Guys, when God gives us something to do, we have a choice. We can either choose to agree with God's power and his strength and choose faith in him, or we can choose to agree with fear. And in everything we do, I want to make sure that I am choosing God's power and God's, fa uh, God's faith and not my own. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So when God shows us the path to take, we can either count on our own understanding and our own strength, or we can count on his and move forward and do what he calls us to do. And even though it is very, very scary to let go of control and move forward, we're called to obedience, to move forward so we can get the blessing that he has for us. In Genesis, there's a story about a guy named Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. And this is, again, there's a billion stories I could have chosen here for, for an example of someone who just moved even though they were afraid and did something amazing. But I figured I would just do like basically one of the first stories in all of scripture. And God comes to Abraham and he says, I want to bless you, but there's something you have to do. And so here's, here's, what, it, here's, what, it, here's what it says. 
It says, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country and your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So, everybody say so. So, Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. So, God comes to Abraham and says, I want to do something amazing in your life. I want to bless you. I want to give you blessings. I want to do something so incredible with your life that you can't even imagine it. But here's, you have to move. You have to, you have to step. You have to move out of the land that you're in and move into a new one. And so what does Abraham do? He's like, okay, I guess I'm moving. I got a word from God. This is really scary, but I'm moving. So he packs up all his stuff and he moves to the promised land. He moves to the place where God calls him to be. Now, what would have happened had Abraham stayed? He would have missed the blessing. He would have missed, if Abraham had given into fear, he would have missed the blessing. If, if he'd have been like, you, you want me to, what do, you, what do you want me to do, God? You want me to pack up all my stuff and you want me to move to the place I will show you? Where am I moving? Bah, I'll show you. Wow, that sounds like a good plan, God. If he, he'd be like, man, that's, that's, that's so scary. If he'd have been like, man, like, like, I, know, I know you want me to move, God, but like, I got my, all my family around here, and like, my mother-in-law makes like, really good chili, which is really cool. And like, I just got my tent set up exactly how I wanted it to. I had to like, carry a piano up like three flights of steps in order to get it into the spot where I wanted it in my tent. I really don't want to move it again. If he had come up with all of these excuses for why he should give into fear as opposed to faith, he would have missed the blessing that God had in store for him. Guys, do not miss the blessing that God has in store for you. He wants to bless your socks off, but you have to be willing to just say, even though I am afraid, I will step and move to where he's calling me to go. Everybody say, do it afraid. Whatever he says regarding college, do it afraid. Whatever he says regarding your work, you do it afraid. Whatever he says regarding your career, do it afraid. Whatever he says regarding dating or marriage, you do it afraid. Whatever he says regarding money or kids or housing or retirement, do it afraid. This is what full surrender looks like, saying, I don't live for me. I only live for you. And so even though this is scary, I will take steps of faith, trusting in your good plan and your strength and not mine. Everybody say, do it afraid. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a really good example of how we can do this. This is just, this is one of those little, uh, one of those little uh, compartments in the tackle box, okay? I'm just going to use this as, as an example. Does that make sense? I'm just going to use this as an example. So everybody say, thanks, Christmas. So every thanks, every, every, uh, at the end of the year, we do what's called a thanks Christmas offering. And what this is, is it's a special gift that's over and above our normal 10%. So it's not the tithe, it's gifts above our tithe that goes specifically towards building God's kingdom. It goes, toward, it goes towards church planting, college, and Pine Lake camps. Guys, last year we raised $650,000 together. That is a big, big deal. And again, that's not people bringing the 10%. That's stuff on top of that saying, God, I'm trusting you with this, but I want to build your kingdom, not my kingdom. And so my challenge for you, we're going to talk about this a lot more in the coming weeks, but my challenge for you is to already be thinking and praying and asking God, hey, how can I step out in faith? How can I move in the midst of fear and just trust you in every area of my life? Spend some time in prayer. Spend some time in conversation with your spouse about, hey, God, what could I, what could I bring? How could I build your kingdom and not my own, even though this is scary, we just move because we don't want to miss the blessing. Amen? Little side note that I wrote in my margins here was I'm sometimes afraid to move when God says move. Go where he calls me to go. I'm afraid to do it sometimes, and I don't get it right every single time, but here's what I'll say. I am so much more afraid of having to run and catch up later. I am so, I am so afraid. That I, do, I just don't want to miss the blessing that he has for me. I don't want to miss it. And so when he says move, I just do my very, not because someone told me I had to, not because someone threatened me, but I just want to be where God is. I want to go where he calls me to go. I want to be who he calls me to be. And so I just do my very best to run and chase after him as best I possibly can. I just don't want to miss his plan. Guys, don't miss it. Everybody say, do it afraid. We've covered a lot of ground today. I've been talking for a while, talking about surrender and what it looks like. 
is we seek his will first in every area of our life. In order to do that, we got to know the word. We count the cost. We say, is God's way better or is my way better? And the answer is God's way is better. It is always worth what I give up so that I can gain what God has for me. We release control. We say, God, I can't control my life anyway. And it is in your hands and I trust you with the outcome. And we do it afraid. When God says move, we just go. And we do it afraid. We do not agree with fear. We agree with faith. And then lastly, number five, we just trust God with the outcome. Everybody say, trust God. Surrender is deciding that no matter what happens, I know what God said, I know what he told me, and I know what the truth is. And so I will step out in faith, even in the middle of fear, I will step out and I will move, and I will trust that all things are in his hands, and that is good enough for me, because he is a good God, and he will take care of me, and he promises to take care of me. A couple verses about this in scripture. This is Esther 4.16. She just says, if I perish, I perish. Daniel 3.17 says, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the images that you have of the, of the gold that you have set up. So these are two groups of people, Esther and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that are in the, in the middle of, of God saying move. They just said, yes, I know what God said. And I will trust in his power and his, and his strength no matter what. I know what the truth is, and I know what he said. I will stand on that no matter what. And here's what I will say. As we choose to release, count the cost, release control, and step in faith, there is peace in that. Because when we surrender all and we put everything into his hands instead of our hands, there is rest because we said, hey, God, I did my part. I, stepped, I, I moved like you told me to move. I stepped like you told me to step. And so it, even though it seems scary, bro, it, it's up to you now. And what scripture says is that God has good plans for your life, amen? And he always seems to come through every time. Just like he did for the people in that story, actually. This is Matthew 16, 25. It's the last verse I want to I I leave you with today. It says, whoever would save his life, will lose it. Well, whoever loses his life for my sake, ding, 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 surrender, will find it. If you spend your entire life just trying to cling to your plan and your will and saying, I can control this, I can make this work, I can make this happen. Remember, our plans are like an etch-a-sketch and they just get shook up. And the more that we continue to just grasp for control and grasp for control and try to control our own lives and try to make our own plans happen, guys, it's like, it's like grasping at sand and it just starts to run through your fingers and you end up in a place where you're like, I don't know how I got to this place. This is what happens when we try to control our own lives and try to live for our own plans. But alternatively, God's plans are stable. Scripture says that a foundation of Christ is a firm foundation. Another place in Scripture calls Jesus the cornerstone. When you build your life on Christ and Christ alone and saying, I will build your kingdom first, there, Scripture also says, he will give you a rich and satisfying life. The life that you are looking for is in God's plans, and it's not in trying to cling to your own. It will always disappoint. It will always let you down. It will always slip right through your fingers right when you thought you had it, but it won't come to fruition God has good plans for you, and he will take you far. It just has to start with full and complete surrender. I don't want life my way. I don't want my plans. I want yours. I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. Bow your heads, close your eyes. This is how we're going to end today. Again, I know we covered a lot of ground. I talked for a long time. But I believe that God is speaking in, this, in his house here this morning. I believe that Holy Spirit is dialing into people's hearts. I believe that that is the case. I believe that he's speaking to each of us in this room. And so I'm going to ask one last question, but I want you to think about your life. Think about your life. If you've zoned out to this point in the message, I want you to dial back in just for a couple seconds. What is God saying to your heart specifically? Think about your life. I want you to ask yourself the question, what area of my life is not fully surrendered to God yet? What area of my life is not fully surrendered to God yet? Maybe it's your money. You haven't been bringing God that first 
Maybe it's, your, it's, it's, it's old friendships. You've been clinging to old friendships that you know are unhealthy and you know are not God's plan for your life, but you just haven't let go of control yet. Maybe you haven't given God your time yet. Maybe you're not, you're, you haven't trusted him with your time and you haven't been spending uh, every morning in prayer and in the word. Maybe it's your energy. Maybe it's your sex life. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's, it, maybe it's your work. Maybe it's your work schedule. And God's calling you to take a break, to take a day off. I don't know what it is. I don't know what God is saying to your heart right now, but I know that in this moment right now, he's saying, hey, surrender all. Surrender every area of your life to me. And what I want you to know also is that God is not mad at you. God is proud of you. If you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, you are the righteousness of Christ. God is exactly proud of you, as exactly proud of you right now as he is of Jesus, because he just sees Jesus when he looks at you, if you are in Christ. So if you feel condemnation in this moment, that is not from God. God is proud of you. He loves you exactly as you are. But in this moment, he is saying, surrender all. Give me every area. I want every area so that I can bless it. And so here's what I'm going to do. Just with every eye, every eye closed, every head bowed, how many of you would be honest, honest enough to say that, yeah, there's, there's a part of my life that I still need to surrender? Or maybe you're sitting here in this room and you're just thinking, I've, I've never started a relationship with Christ. I've never surrendered my life to him. What you just needed to hear today is that God loves you. He is proud of you. He has good plans for you. Start that relationship with him today. Just by a show of hands, with nobody looking, how many of you would be honest enough to say that there's an area of your life that you still need to surrender or that you just need to surrender your life to him for the first time? I'm going to invite you to put a hand in the air. Put a hand in the air if that's you. All right, you can put those hands down. Guys, that's a big deal. God sees those hands. Remember, he is not mad at you. He is proud of you. If you are in Christ, you are the righteousness of God, and there's nothing that you can do to change it. But he's calling us right now to full and complete surrender. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us in a prayer of surrender together. And so if you just put your hand in the air, this is a prayer that I want you to say loud and proud. Everybody say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for doing life without you. I'm sorry for trying to control my own life. I don't want to do that anymore. Today I choose to follow you with every area of my life. I surrender all to you, Lord Jesus. Whatever you ask, I'm in. Whatever you say, I'll do. My life is in your hands, Jesus. Thanks for paying the price for my sins and promising me a good future in this life and the next one. I'm yours, Jesus. Every part of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, give it up for every single person who just prayed that prayer, guys. That's the most important decision that you will ever make in your entire life. Now, I know I talked for a long time, but the last thing I'm going to say is this. If you have never gotten baptized, evidence that you have surrendered, evidence that you've given every area of your life to Christ, is by going public in your faith and and getting baptized. So if you would like to get baptized, come talk to Pastor Silas down here at the end of the service. Maybe some of you, maybe that's, that's that little tackle box slot that you've been trying to wait for the right day where you, you know, did your hair right or wore the right pants. I don't know what it is. Stop looking for excuses. Just go get baptized. Just go get baptized. Are you guys glad you came to church this morning? All right, go ahead and sit up on your feet for me. Thank you so much for coming to hang out. Again, do not miss next week because next week we're talking about kingdom vision. Pastor Eric is going to be talking about where this church is headed as a whole. It's going to be incredible. Uh, we're going to end the service the way that we do every single service, though, which is by saying Psalms 67, 1 and 2. So let's say this together. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for coming to church.